Signalis is a game about grief, loss of identity, oppression, and launching lesbians into outer space, and I love it. Today we're going to go into everything, from the story to the characters, references to other media, theories, and more. This is actually going to be my second video on the game, which is rare for me, so this is kind of a special event. And it's also the face reveal for the channel, which I'll talk about that decision more at the end, because I, I know it's a weird time. Um, I'm a little bit worried about this, about how it's going to go, I'll be honest with you. I haven't really done anything like this before, and I don't know whose idea this was to film out in the woods, because, you know, it's bright. The background noise, I, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. This is probably going to be a disaster. Signalis is a classic sci-fi survival horror inspired by the likes of Silent Hill, Resident Evil, and artists from other art forms like David Lynch, Stanley Kubrick, and H.P. Lovecraft. There will obviously be major spoilers for Signalis in this video, so if you haven't played the game, I highly recommend you go do that. If you don't, um, that's fine, I'm not the boss of you, but you'd be doing yourself a disservice. Anyways, here is my take at dissecting the madness of Signalis. This whole video will be broken down into a couple of sections, so if you feel like there's some stuff you're confident on already, uh, chapters will be on, so feel free to skip around and get some answers for other stuff. First off, I think it's important to lay some groundwork for people who haven't played the game, or maybe people that are a bit rusty in the lore, so first we're going to be going over some basic terminology. The first couple are Gestalt and Replica, two that you're going to be hearing a lot. Um, a Gestalt is basically just a normal human. Flesh and blood, it's a person. In German, uh, Gestalt also means shape, which we'll come back to in a minute. A replica, on the other hand, is a biomechanical human, so part human, part robot, kind of like an android. Gestalts provide the neural patterns for replicas, giving them traits like their appearance, their personality, and things like that, hence the term shape for the humans. It's also stated that this process involves taking a human from society and sort of cryogenically preserving them and then erasing their records from like public memory so that the government can keep using them to create more replicas basically. From here the memories of the person that provided the neural pattern are sort of suppressed in the replica's mind so that they're not bogged down by like a past life, they're starting out fresh. Which again we'll come back later, that's kind of important. One of the biggest issues with replicas is persona degradation which we'll come back a couple of times so we're going to cover it now. Persona degradation is basically when a replica starts to develop individual personality traits that make them different from other replicas of the exact same model as them. Every replica of one type is designed to be exactly the same, but the longer they exist, the higher risk they are of developing persona degradation, because if they're just around longer, they'll start to develop their own memories and their own experiences. It can also lead to the replica unlocking memories from their past life, which can lead to them developing traits like laziness, happiness, desires, um, basic human needs, you know, stuff like that, which is a problem. The nation, which is, again, something we'll come back to, views them as machines, so when they start acting like something more than machines, almost human, that's a problem, and as soon as it's noticed, they're decommissioned, so... Yeah. Decommissioned, yeah. Lastly is bioresonance, um, something that is mysterious, really important, and we know almost nothing about it. Bioresonance, in a lot of notes, is described as a technology, but it's more of like a spiritual, innate ability that some people have. Um, people who are bioresonant might be able to lift small objects without touching them, like telekinesis. Um, read people's minds, implant thoughts into people's minds, um, alter reality, or create life entirely. Um, the last two are very, very rare, and we don't really see them ever. Again, although it is described as a technology, um, even scientists who use it, because bioresonance basically is used to implant uh, neural patterns from just alts into replicas, even scientists who use it for that don't really understand how it works. They don't understand what it is or what it does, and it's just, it's a shit show. No one, no one really gets it, and people just throw it around. So, that's fantastic. Kicking off the locations is the Yusan Empire, which isn't really a location, it's more of like a political faction or a body. And it only controls, currently, two planets in the solar system. Things are not going well for them, not even a little bit. The first is Buyan, which is the planet closest to the sun and is an incredibly 
toxic atmosphere. Because of how poisonous it is under the clouds, the only place anything can be built on Buyan is above the clouds, which is actually where the Empire's palace is. The second planet still under their control is Katez, which is a vast desert wasteland planet. Think like Mars. The Empire is implied to be a heavily religious state, um, and a lot of its goals, beliefs, and ideas are attributed to uh, specifically bioresonance and its founder, the Grand Empress, which we don't know much about her, but uh, it is understood that she was incredibly powerful, incredibly bioresonant, and she created the very first replicas and was able to kind of form humanity into the Yusan Empire, which again, is not doing so hot. The rest of the notable locations are under the Yusan Nation, um, which I know is a bit confusing. We'll just call them the Empire and the Nation for now. Um, but the one we're talking about now is the Nation, okay? The Nation is a lot more uh, militaristic and is known as a repressive authoritarian regime. They're focused solely on efficiency, control, and military power. They're, they're not nice people. The Nation's capital is housed on Hymat, which is a moon covered in sprawling factories um, and one large building that is essentially the capital to the nation. It's also home for Aeon, known as the National Ministry for Work and Education. Um, Aeon oversees pretty much everything in terms of work, education, culture, and security. They're like the catch-all, they're the government, basically, um, but they do everything. So I'm currently on vacation in beautiful, sunny Canada. Um, and it dawned on me while editing the video, um, specifically around this part, that there's a lot of um, stuff in other languages that I don't really touch on in the video. Uh, there's a couple of points where there's like Mandarin, Chinese on the screen, um, German is a big one because the developers are German, and um, I don't really explain any of that or go into it in the video. Um, and the main reasoning for that is because most of them that show on the screen is really just extra context or um, like flavor to uh, to put in the game uh, while you're playing it. Um, so it's not super important. Uh, the only the only thing that comes to mind right now that's super important in another language that it doesn't also show in English or say in English at some point is um, a phrase in German uh, during the secret ending, which we, we do talk about in the video. But other than that, there's nothing super important. Um, if I'm wrong, obviously, let me know in the comments. But as far as I'm aware, that's pretty much it. Uh, all right, back to it, thank you. Two notable things that they force upon their people are uh, forced labor and re-education, uh, both of which are kinder terms than they deserve. We'll put it that way for right now. The system's second planet is Veneta, which is currently under control of the nation. This is where humanity resides, most of humanity, or um, resided, as, as we'll get to. It's sort of like the Earth of Signalis. Veneta was the site of a bloody and very long war between the Empire and the nation. It was incredibly violent, um, the planet was bombed to shit, and uh, the planet that was once known as the Cradle to Mankind, as it was called, is now almost completely submerged under the planet's ocean. With the conflict's resolution, the nation actually regained control of Veneta, um, but the Empire is still using a lot of its resources, because they have less planets to defend, they're still using a lot of their resources to blockade Veneta, so that um, restoration efforts and humanitarian efforts can't get to Veneta, um, to like restore the planet and feed any refugees or civilians. Uh, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Um, Again, this is all background to the game. It's not really important to the game's main story, but it's fun to know the lore, right? If you really care. The outermost planet in the system is Lang, where actually most of the game takes place inside of the S23 Serpinski, which I'll fill you in on in a minute. Lang is rather vast um, and remote, but it has a lot of uh, natural resources and minerals just below the surface, which makes it a very popular planet for mining. The final planet under the nation's Iron Fist is Rotfront, an ashy planet with the most renowned colonies. Um, the, uh, the ash and the smog on Rotfront is so bad from all the factories that the inhabitants actually have to wear gas masks pretty much wherever they go. Rotfront is where a lot of the flashbacks in the game take place, and it's also where the final, like, third end of the game happens. So now, let's talk about the Penrose 512. Throughout the game, we have a couple of moments here. We have the intro, 
the end, and then uh, somewhere in the middle, right after the uh, the fake ending. To understand why Elster and Ariane are on the Penrose, you first have to understand what the Penrose program is. This was a project created by the Yusan Nation where they would pair a Gestalt and a replica and then just send them hurtling through space um, towards the Oort Cloud in order to find a habitable planet. Um, there's a lot of theories about the Penrose program, um, which we will talk about later after we run through the main story. Um, and it's, it's juicy. So for the actual project, there are typically three phases, but we only really know anything about the third phase because that's all we get notes of. Phase three begins after about 3,000 cycles, which in game is about seven years and nine months. Uh, in, in the case of reaching phase three, the mission is considered a failure as the crew has found no habitable planet, um, at which point the ship and replica both start to break down, leaking radiation everywhere and uh, killing the replica, the gestalt, everything. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the actual story is all of the replica types. Um, again, this isn't super important, but I think it's good to familiarize yourself with them um, so that if you hear them brought up, you kind of know what I'm talking about. So let's just get into it, I guess. Um, so first is Elster, our player character who is designed to be a combat engineer and technician. They were primarily made for orbital missions. They're usually sent out to places that need uh, big repairs and big missions like that. They are generally very cold and don't get along with other gestalts or replicas. Next up is the Falka unit, who is said to bear a striking resemblance to the Great Revolutionary and her daughter. This unit is the highest ranking replica and the most bioresonant and powerful by a mile, several miles, several hundred miles. It's not even close. They are actually so strong that they're considered Wonder Waffen, otherwise known as Wonder Weapon or Super Weapons by the Empire and are often used in propaganda. As far as rank goes, the Adler unit is second in command to Falka, but it is not nearly as strong. Adlers are specialty units, primarily being used for management and administrative purposes. They're not really combat units. The Aura is a rather old, low-cost unit used for general purposes like repairs, uh, construction, things like that. Calibri is another fairly high-ranking unit uh, that is capable of bioresonance. Not quite as strong as Falka, not, again, not even close. And that ability is typically used to promote a more um, cohesive squad and uh, just promote teamwork and generally improve the mood of all of the replicas around her. The Yule is another highly versatile low-cost unit like the Aura and typically, rather than laborious tasks, takes up things like cooking, cleaning, um, nursing, and general office work. Star, much like Yule and Aura units, stars are low-cost and um, Rather than having a bunch of different tasks, they are made for security. The Storch units are essentially upgraded stars. They have higher combat capabilities, and they're typically deployed as Overwatch and sort of team leaders to stars. You know, keep them in line. Lastly is the Mina, a unit used for um, mining down in the mines uh, due to their heavy duty frame. Okay, so from this point forward, I'm going to be looking at my laptop a lot more because <laughs> there's a lot of story. There's a, there's a lot, um, and I just, you know, I can't, I, I can't find it in me to memorize all of it, uh, what I have written down. So I hope you can find it in yourself to forgive me. Um, but let's just, let's just go right into it. So we ran through the main story in the last video, um, but I'll spare you all the cryptic stuff. That was more of an experiential look at the game. Now we're looking at it from a more analytical lens. Um, so let's talk about it. So the game starts with Elster waking up from a cryopod on Rotfront, right? There's a faded picture of Ariane and another girl in the cockpit, and uh, we grab it, and then we leave the ship uh, after putting on a suit, and uh, we walk out into the planet. Eventually, we come to a big circle hole in the ground, we go down, we crawl through a tunnel, and we're inside of a bedroom. In this bedroom, you pick up a book called The King in Yellow. Um, the computer sends a message, the radio plays, and uh, you get the sequence of Elster basically melting. A quote shows on screen, which is important. Uh, so I want to make sure I get it right, of course. Uh, Great holes secretly are digged where Earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learnt to walk that ought to crawl. Um, this one's actually a quote from H.P. Lovecraft's The Festival, which is 
one of the biggest inspirations to this game. And um, basically this quote, what it's saying is that all of the unnatural evil things that are going to or are arising from the earth are basically because of humanity's tampering, which is pretty much this whole game. And we'll get more into that later, like the specifics of it. And after this quote plays, we see remember our promise on the screen, um, which isn't relevant to us yet but we'll come back to. Immediately after the opening, uh, we're just inside of the S23 Serpinski, inside the bathroom. Eventually, we go and we show the picture of the girl to a replica that's still alive, and it's important to note that the image has changed. It's not actually Ariane in the picture anymore, um, the white-haired girl, Ariane. It's now a brunette girl named Alina Sayo. We find a couple of replicas that have been corrupted, and they're sort of decayed and rotted. Eventually, we stumble across a young gestalt named Isa Ito, who basically just warns you about being in the facility and then just leaves, saying she's looking for somebody herself. On the next floor, uh, you hop down and you find this big mass of flesh in the kitchen that's just sort of breathing. It doesn't acknowledge your existence. It doesn't speak. It doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there and pulses just in the corner. It's great. Oh my god, there's a spider on my camera. Ugh webs all over my camera what the fuck um great example of the hp lovecraft quote but at some point on this floor you find a small box with uh, a butterfly on front and you open it up and it takes you to a flashback on rot front where you're at this like uh this this radio inside um contains a message that's addressed to ariane and someone else named iris who is maintaining the station um, there's also a radio transmitter you can use to go back to Serpinski. You just go outside, you tune it to the radio tower, and it takes you back. From here, you'll eventually get an ID card for the elevator, and it'll take you down to the third floor. If there's not anything super important, I'll just kind of breeze over the section. And um, on the third floor, there's not a whole lot, so we'll, we'll go kind of quick. Here, you're basically meant to uh, gather all these keys to open this big door, um, one of which takes you to another first-person flashback sequence, uh, not much happens. It's Ariane sitting alone on a train. It's essentially meant to show Ariane's loneliness and her quality of life on Rotfront, um, which is important to who she is. Eventually, you'll get all the keys to open up this big door, uh, which leads to the Mina boss fight. Uh, we talked about her in the replica section. After the boss fight, you're introduced to Adler, who we also talked about in the replica section. Um, there's only one Adler, to be clear. In this game, there's only one Adler. There's not multiple. Uh, so we'll just call him Adler because he's an important character, he'll come back a lot. What is going on? Sorry, my, my... something is not functioning the way it's supposed to be. Oh, it's dark. Oh, shit. Um, I do sincerely apologize for whatever the hell happened to the video there. Um, I, I'm kind of new to this whole um, using a camera thing to be honest, uh, especially for video. And I probably should have picked a better location. I don't know, I really don't know what I was thinking, but I, um, it's just, it's something we're getting used to. Uh, we'll figure it out as we go. After the boss fight, you're introduced to Adler, who is the facility's administrative unit. Um, he welcomes you quite warmly, actually, and you show him the picture and he's like, what the hell? I don't know who that is. And then he pushes you down the elevator as he warns you that you shouldn't have returned implying that he's met you before. Huh, isn't that weird? Uh, while unconscious, we get another flashback to Rotfront from the perspective of Issa. While looking for her twin sister, Erica Ito, she walks in on Ariane being bullied by several students. Um, we later find out that Erica Ito was the one who stopped Ariane's bullies. After waking up on floor five, there are a couple of things to note here. The first is a short cutscene showing Adler approaching the distraught Isa, um, at which point he starts stalking her through the facility. On this floor, we also get our first visual of the island, um, a painting that is a repeating motif. It comes back so much and is very important to understanding the game. So I just want to call attention to it now. Not super important, but we get a visual of the solar system. Again, not necessary, not vital, but it is cool world building. Eventually, you will reach the office of Commander Falka. Again, like Adler, there's only one of these, um, the most powerful, highest ranking replica. Um, she's fallen ill after something beyond the gate touched her, whatever that means. Her diary details that her memories feel like 
they belong to someone else. She sees people that she's never known, um, she's never interacted with, and she describes what sounds like Ariane, you know, white hair, and um, basically it drove her insane, but now she's asleep in her hospital bed, so... Uh, sometime after this, you'll also find a way into Adler's personal belongings, um, where his own diary describes what sounds like persona degradation. He talks about memories from his gestalt life, but for some reason also remembers Ariane. Finding a way into a strange lockbox gives us access to a separate diary where he acknowledges his own loss of sanity, um, but he chooses to hide it out of fear of being decommissioned. Uh, he feels like he misremembers things, or even sees things that outright did not happen, and he notes that it all sort of started happening when Falka fell ill. He's particularly shaken when he realizes that every single page has been signed as the same day, when he doesn't remember writing some of them at all. Um, I know this isn't a review, but fuck. Oh god, that's such a good moment. Inside this lockbox with his second diary, it also gives us access to his keycard, which allows us to go down into the mine with the service elevator. As we head down that elevator, we get another cutscene. Basically, Adler is uh, trying, he's looking around for Issa, she's hiding behind a pillar, and then she sneaks up on him, stabs him in the eye, and he falls down the hole. The mine area is really short, like probably the shortest section in the game, maybe except for like the first floor, um, which you might not be expecting uh, the first time through, which I think was is a cool uh, subversion because you're expecting it to be like the build up to the whole game. And then it's just like, it's literally like a, a 10 minute section. It's great. The only thing of major importance here is that we find another note from Alina that remarks everyone being gone. She, she acknowledges everyone just outright disappearing or sort of dying and becoming these freaky zombies, right? She also says that she can't even find Elster, which is you. Um, and it's particularly strange because you don't, know anything about Alina Sayo. Uh, granted, you don't know anything about Ariane either, but you don't know Alina's connection to Elster, to you. It doesn't make any sense to you. But at this point, the impression is that you know each other. Eventually, you find that big hole we saw in the scene between Issa and Adler, and naturally, as anyone would, you jump straight down it because you hear water at the bottom. I think there's someone sneaking up on me right now. Dude, this could be the last thing I record before I die. I'm sure it's fine. So, uh, falling down the hole takes us to another first-person sequence, which we later learn is presumably the island from that painting earlier that I called attention to. Emerging from the cave, you find a bunch of notes, many of which are famous philosophical quotes regarding death and or existence. Uh, skulls are also littered across the beach, and eventually we're brought back to reality, or, you know, something like reality, whatever the hell's going on, in this dingy, perverted version of the facility, which we'll call nowhere. Eventually, as you're exploring nowhere, you'll come across this big um, mass of flesh, this big living thing under that area, much like the mass of flesh you saw in the kitchen, um, except huge. It's way bigger, way bigger. Um, this ties back to the quote from Lovecraft with this unearthly creature only being revealed as the staff at Lang decided to keep mining down, breaking into this liminal facility space where the big flesh monster was. Obviously, we find Issa as she's being attacked by this big Silent Hill cage monster, who we then kill, and Issa falls unconscious. After waking up, she gives us a rifle, and then just disappears. We also find another page from Alina, who is describing things that were more or less familiar with at this point. You know, her memory's blurry, she remembers her name and life, but also the name and life of somebody else. Um, and also her hair's turning white, which, you know, isn't that weird. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure it's not that big of a deal. So eventually, uh, in Nowhere, you'll find, through puzzles, you'll get these six plates that you can use to open this big door, sort of like the one on the floor with the mina. And this takes you to the first ending. Uh, you walk out into this big, red, like, desert-like place, and it has these black obelisks everywhere. Um, by a big black gate, Adler kneels, questioning what touched Falka and what lies beyond the gate, and responding that it doesn't matter, you carry on. You pass a bunch of dead Elsters before reaching the Penrose 512 crashed in this desert. Along with about a million variations of the Isle of Death, you're shown memories of the Venetian War, your past life, Elster's past life as a Jestal. Um, trying to open the hatch to the Penrose, Elster's arm snaps off, and she rolls down the Penrose, and she dies alone in the desert. So, that is our 
fake ending. Um, restarting the game will allow you to get the real endings, though, of which there are four. Um, so when, when you restart, you wake up back in the Penrose, and it's much cleaner um, than the other times you've seen it, at least. You do some routine maintenance, and then you go to see Ariane, who is your partner in the Penrose program. Elster and Ariane share a dance and then fall asleep, at which point you're whisked back to where you died, with Ariane standing over you, forcing you to get back up. With this, you uh, get back inside the Penrose, you find some especially distressing notes, and, uh, you know, they're begging for death. These are, of course, written by Ariane, and uh, you repair yourself, you go back to the Serpinski, but not before another vision on the beach. So, there are different notes here this time, there's still the skulls everywhere, and to escape this time, to actually leave the island instead of just timing out, you have to reach this uh, wooden ferry with a lantern on one end, and getting in will take you back to the Serpinski. Luckily, this section is just one hallway now, leading to yet another hole, which will take you to one of the best cutscenes in the game, um, showing Adler mourning over Falka's body, removing his skin, and becoming something else entirely. And now, you're on Rotfront. So the main goal here in Rotfront is to get a bunch of these tarot cards that will in turn show you the proper positions of the dials for a puzzle in the main lobby. Um, an interesting note describes a teacher's evaluation of Ariane, attributing her unusual interests and behaviors to the fact that she was raised alone by her mother rather than a large community of people, um, which is just a weird thing um, in Yusan. They're very concerned with the group rather than the individual. The teacher also says that her friendship with the Ito sisters likely doesn't help those weird interests of hers. Um, so one computer archive shows a bunch of medical records a couple of which are heavily implied to be the Gestalt frames for certain replica models. Eventually, you'll make your way into the Ito family bookstore, where you'll find a couple of banned books detailing the nation's history and a couple of other banned topics like Bioresonance and the Grand Empress. Entering into the main body of the store, you find Isa, who says she couldn't find who she was looking for, which, spoiler alert, was her sister Erica. Um, and then she just dies right in front of you. Um, she apologizes, she keels over, and she just melts into the floor. So behind the counter of the bookstore, you'll find a shrine with Isa and Erica, um, and then the final tarot card, Death. You take these uh, to the tarot puzzle, you use these to get the dial positions, and then you go and solve the main puzzle in the lobby. This then takes you to that bedroom you were in in the prologue, which is Ariane's room, um, and you have two options here. You can either pick up the king in yellow again, or you can open up the safe. Uh, opening the safe is how you get the secret ending, and the other three are easier, so we'll go through those first. So this next small section will be the same no matter which ending you get. Uh, it's just that cutscene at the end that's a bit different. So after picking up the book, you enter into the apartment where there are a couple of notes. The first describes Arian's work history, including her compulsory military service. At the end, it says if she's not back in the military or a job by the end of the season, then she's gonna get sent to the Serpinski. Interesting, let's keep going. So the other note is addressed to Arianne from her mother, who talks about a picture Arianne sent her. She describes the image of Alina Sayo and the other soldier taken on Vanita and points out how much Alina looks like Ariane. How strange. Moving on through this apartment takes you to the final boss fight, and in the hallway leading up to it are a couple of notes. The first is, uh, it just talks about the general corruption of all of the replicas um, and everyone in the facility. Nothing too crazy. You know, we've seen it before. The second is where things get a bit interesting. So it talks about things that we've seen before, right? A crashed ship, a strange gate, a hole in the ground. It talks about a promise, but the weirdest part is that it seems to be signed by Falka. There's another note from Adler simply telling you to turn back. And lastly, another note from Commander Falka, who is talking about the dance shared between Elster and Ariane, and she just wants to go back to that moment. She's claimed your own memories for herself. And now we walk into the final room where Falco rises from her bed and we fight, uh, which I, I'm not going to describe to you. That's not what this is for. The gist is uh, she wants to end the nightmare for both of you because she believes that Ariane doesn't want you or Falca. You and Falco are now kind of the same. You have the same memories. She, she doesn't, Ariane doesn't want you anymore, basically, is the, is the gist. I think you get it. I think. You kill her, you see more of the island, and then you meet Adler once more at the gate. He tries to kill you, but misses, and uh, you shoot him first. From here, you travel back into the wasteland to the Penrose. A couple of notes gives you more insight on a lot of different things. 
Another note from Arianne talks about how unhappy she was on Rotfront, which we kind of already knew, but she says that that's why she signed up for the Penrose program. Um, she saw the photo of Alina and that other soldier, and she saw it as sort of a way out, a way off of Rotfront to get a better life, because anything was better than what she went through there. And then, lastly, there's another note that describes the beginning of a slow, painful death Arianne is going to face on the Penrose. And now, the ending. The first possible ending is called Leave. Every ending is <laughs> bad. Not bad. They're, they're good, they fit, but they're fucking depressing. Okay? This is the worst of them. Uh, so the promise, to be clear, you know, remember a promise, the thing that's been said a hundred times. The promise is the promise that Elster would kill Arianne to spare her from that drawn-out, agonizing death she would face as the Penrose kind of crumbled, right? In the leave ending, she can't even face her. She doesn't go into the room. She just turns around, she leaves the ship, and she dies out in the desert. Um, but yeah, sad, right? The second option for your endings is memory, um, which is likely the first one you'll get, or at least it's the first one I got. Um, and this might actually be the saddest. This this really, this might, this might be the worst. Um, so in memory, Elster does enter Arianne's room, but there's one problem. Arianne doesn't remember their promise. Not only does she not remember their promise, Arianne doesn't remember Elster at all. Um, so Elster can't go through with killing her. So she just lays down next to her pod and she falls asleep, assumedly uh, just dying while Arianne is left suffering alive sad. I really do think that's the worst one. That one's fucking depressing as shit. Um, the third ending is Promise. Uh, I bet you can probably guess where this one goes. Um, you go in, Arian remembers, you obviously have some qualms about killing her, and she says you have to do it. So you apologize, and then you end her life. This all is like kind of vaguely graphic. Can I even <laughs> upload this? Um, anyways, she, she thanks you for killing her for sparing her of that life of agony. Um, and Elster, who is clearly destroyed by watching her loved one die, just lays down next to the pot and dies. Again, sad, so sad. So those three aren't obtained by any choices, really. The one you get depends on certain things like, uh, like how many enemies you killed, how many NPCs you talked to, how long it takes you to get through the game. But the secret ending is there, there's a way, there's a tried and true way to get it. So after you beat the game, uh, you have to play certain frequencies in certain rooms, uh, which each one will give you a key. Um, and taking these keys to the end of the game allows you to open the safe in Ariane's bedroom. Inside the safe, there is a lily, you know, the flower. Should be right there. Um, more on that lily later, or shortly, actually. So, uh, we're shown our Elster take the lily, and she brings it to a ritual site before falling over dead, where we see other Elsters have done the same thing. Um, and in the middle of all the pedestals is a strange, like, square object with a hole in the middle. We see some German text on the screen, which reads... Esis volendet das Geheimnis dieses Gottes wie es verkundigt hat ihren Nekten den Propheten. Yeah, I took three years of German in high school, if you can't tell. I couldn't tell you what that meant on my own, but um, roughly that translates to the mystery of this God is complete as she declared it to her servants, the prophets. Um, a big eyeball appears over the Penrose, and inside we see Elster and Ariane dancing once more, and for what we can only assume is eternity. Um, so, that's Signalis. Uh, what the sincere fuck did I just watch is probably what you're thinking, and unfortunately that's also what I'm thinking, which is bad, because I'm making this video. <laughs> So let's try and figure this out together, shall we? So, the most important thing to understand is that most of what we see in the game is not real. Um, sort of. All of the planets are certainly real places in the world. 
the Serpinski is a real place, and most of these characters did or do exist. Um, but most of the actual events in the game are taking place in a dream, like a a, a fake reality that's been created by Ariane. In each ending, except for Promise, the text "Remember Our Promise" shows up at some point. Um, this means that the dream will continue to repeat until Ariane is finally killed, which is why we see so many dead Elsters throughout the game because they couldn't kill Ariane. Elsters are typically deployed for specific missions, so there weren't any others at the Serpinski already, so every single one we see is a variant of you that tried to kill Ariane and failed. In Leave and Memory, Elster dies, Ariane doesn't, so the implication is that a new Elster is just sent back to the beginning. The artifact ending, however, is going to take a little more explaining. Um, pretty much everything else past this point is a lot of ideas, uh, nothing is concrete. Um, also, I'm stupid, so take it all with a grain of salt. Um, a lot of the symbolism is easier to understand when you look at the stories Signalis draws from, particularly The King in Yellow by Robert Chambers, and its short story within it, The Mask, which is the only one we're going to go into. These stories I haven't read myself, not yet at least, I, I plan on it, um, so much of the interpretation will be based on my own limited understanding from reading on it rather than reading the story itself. Um, with the help of Signalis' subreddit, which, if you have any questions after this video, other creators have probably done a better job at this whole thing than I have. Um, I don't know, I haven't watched any yet. Um, and you could also go to the Reddit for answers. Filter by story. The King in Yellow is a collection of short stories, which are connected by references um, to certain characters and overarching themes, right? The book was released in 1895 and is considered an early form of horror and Victorian Gothic literature. It also has hints of fantasy, romance, science fiction, and other genres, of course. The Mask follows four characters. Boris, who is an innovative sculptor. Alec, the narrator and also a painter. Jack, who isn't super important here, he just comes up like a little bit. And Genevieve, who is the lover of Boris. At some point, Boris obtains a mysterious fluid that allows him to turn anything into marble, into a real, hyper-realistic sculpture. This is obviously incredibly taboo because it, it's not really specified where it came from. It's like a sort of supernatural, um, like mystical happening. Um, and so he keeps it a secret, but he does share it with Alec, Jack, and then Genevieve. Uh, Alec's first exposure to it um, comes when Boris demonstrates the ability on a lily, which he sees as having destroyed the flower. Alec realizes the relationship between Boris and Genevieve um, has, hasn't seemed as happy as it once was, and he wonders if Boris will someday be tempted to use the fluid to turn Genevieve into a statue. Genevieve falls violently ill, with Alec following soon after. His fever is so serious that he falls into delirium for weeks, and then when he wakes up, he learns that Boris and Genevieve are both dead, gone. Basically what happened is uh, Genevieve started using drugs and without the support of Alec, uh, she ended up tossing herself into the pool of um, statue juice, turning herself into marble. Shortly after, Boris ended his own life. Not with the statue juice, he uh, he just, can I say that? He didn't, he didn't turn himself into a statue. He just like, Ch -ch -ch. yeah. Um, so Boris requested that uh, at the time of his death, the uh, the statue juice would be drained and all of the evidence of it would be just erased completely. Um, so Jack does this as requested and Boris leaves his statue collection in his will to Alec, including the statue of Genevieve herself and one called Madonna, which looks just like Genevieve as it was modeled after her. They look the same. Literal years pass. Uh, I think it's two years, I believe. Jack leaves for England. This takes place in Paris. Jack leaves for England, and Alec is left alone with the statues. Um, a couple of them come back to life, including a couple of Genevieve's pet goldfish that Boris froze, and the lily also comes back. Alec bursts into the statue room, and Genevieve is there, alive, sitting at the foot of the Madonna. Um, this whole thing is a lot more climactic <laughs> in the story. I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of running through it because I'm running out of first of all daylight and also battery, so. 
you know, we're trying to get this, uh, you know, wrapped up a little bit. And uh, and that's the mask. So what does it mean and what does it have to do with Signalis? So the lily, as you may know, is a symbol of rebirth. Um, and the significance of it in the story just before Genevieve breaks out is very important. Um, this is actually a happy ending as well as the relationship between Boris and Genevieve wasn't really a positive one. He loved her not as a wife, but more as a possession. And so that relationship that the two of them had is sort of symbolized by her turning into a statue because she's a material thing. And the so-called unmasking is when Boris realizes that he didn't love her as a wife. He loved, she was more of a trophy to him, which is why he ends his own life. It's, it's not because he lost her. It's because of the realization that she didn't really mean anything to him. And also, um, she, her true love was Alec. She didn't really love Boris either. So, you know, it was doomed from the start. That's indicated a bit better in the story, but again, I skipped over some stuff for the sake of brevity. So I think the dream is sort of symbolic of the fluid uh, in the mask. Everything gets stuck in the dream. It's a prison just as much as the Serpinski is, but not everything is one to one um, between the, com the comparison between Signalis and the King in Yellow. Uh, one overarching theme throughout all of the short stories, though, is that things change when they interact with the King, which... The King in Yellow is both the name of a famous play in the story, and it's also the name, again, in-universe of a, like, mythological non-human being who is incredibly powerful. And so anything that touches or interacts with the King um, changes, fundamentally, as a person, as, a, as an idea. I think you get it. It's heavily implied that the marble fluid was obtained as a result of Boris studying the play, which then, you know in turn drove him nuts. I've seen people say that Ariane is analogous to the king in yellow, like the actual being, because everything around her that interacts with her, especially after her bioresonance and latent ability comes out, um, it sort of twists. Uh, even reality gets completely destroyed. <laughs> However, in the artifact ending, you turn away from the king in yellow, right? Uh, you reject it and instead you choose the lily. Taking the lily and going through the ritual, you die, but then are rebirthed with Ariane, having that good ending forever. Um, Falka's line where she says she'll never dance with us again is Elster's biggest fear, and her biggest desire is just being able to dance with her again. Um, but as sad as it is, Artifact is the best, happiest ending in Signalis. And so now we're going to talk about a couple of uh, smaller theories and things. Um, so first of all, the Isle of the Dead. Um, the island painting is called the Isle of the Dead. It's a real painting by Arnold Bucklin, Bucklin, Berklin. I, I'm not sure how it's, I forget how it's pronounced. I think it's Berklin. Anyways, the artist um, drew several different versions of the Isle of the Dead, and in each version of it, the pictured figures, they don't get any closer to the island, to death much like Ariane and Elster, who continue to live until Ariane dies. To support this, after Elster dies the first time, we go back to the island, right, in that first-person sequence, and the only way to leave is on that ferry. And that is literally, literally, Elster cheating death, leaving death, so that she can come back to life and kill Ariane, right? Are you following? She literally returns from death to fulfill her promise to Ariane. That's how important it is. Um, so in the same way, the white figure in the painting traveling to the island is said to be death itself. And that part sort of mirrors Elster as she's essentially the Grim Reaper on a mission to take Ariane um, to death once and for all. And now, Alina Sayo. Um, so this is one of the most mysterious characters in the whole game. And I think it's also one of the, int the, the most interesting because there's like, there's not even... There's like a concrete, not concrete, but there's a, a general symbolism with the Island of Death that people can agree on, that that people have in common. They, they agree what the Isle of Death represents in Signalis, but people don't really agree on what the hell is going on with Alina Sayo. Um, and we don't really know anything about her, even by the end, at least nothing that feels real. So let me drop a bomb on you real quick. So in the picture um, of Alina and the other soldier, that other soldier is Lilith Ito. 
um, the older sister of Issa and Erica Ito. Uh, Lilith, often shortened to Lily, is also the Gestalt frame for the Elster unit, um, and Lilith clearly had a strong connection to Alina. Uh, we also get the sense that Alina and Ariane are connected in some way, but we don't really know how. They look alike, they were both sent to the Sherpinski at some point, and each of them were close with Lilith, or a version of Lilith. My personal favorite theory is that Alina Seo doesn't really exist at all, at least not in the way that we're led to believe in-game. I think what happened is that Ariane's subconscious replaced Ariane in the dream with Alina uh, Seo so that she wouldn't have to relive the trauma she went through at the Sierpinski. Um Unfortunately, we have to assume that the notes and stuff we find uh, at Rotfront, especially the messages from... Alina's mother are real, um, which means Alina was real at some point in time. We just don't know when for sure, um, but she was definitely real during the Venetian War, at least. However, I don't think she was actually on Lang. Again, I think she just took Ariane's place in the memory to, again, spare her of the pain of like reliving that whole experience. Um, and to me, it makes sense that our Elster did know Alina at some point, and during one of the loops, the memory got sort of garbled and she got mixed in with Ariane. Um, I think that their visual similarities as well are simply coincidence, and it's just an added reason as to why she sort of got confused with Ariane, just because they sort of looked alike. So now I want to talk about the Penrose program, which we, we touched on in the, uh, the opening sections, but I'd like to talk about it a little bit more. So, obviously, in the case of the Penrose 512, things didn't really work out, um, since Ariane's bioresonance prevented her from dying, sending reality into this spiral. Because of just how powerful Ariane seems to be, it's hard to say what, if anything, um, that happens in the game is real apart from what we see at the Penrose. Um, one popular theory regarding the Penrose program is that it was used, in this case, or outright created to dispose of incredibly strong um, bioresonant individuals that might pose a threat to the nation at some point. There are a couple of things that support this, uh, one of which being Ariane is certainly dangerous. I, I think that's something we can all agree on. Like, she's clearly very strong, and um, if you're on her bad side, things aren't going to go well. So they just decided to launch her as far as possible, and eventually they just assumed she'd die, which they were wrong obviously. The program as a whole doesn't really make any sense either because it started following the Venetian War and the nation's economic state after the Venetian War was incredibly, incredibly poor. They were very, very poor and I just don't see a reason why they could possibly justify such a high risk, high reward expedition, even if there was a tiny, tiny, tiny chance that they might find a new planet to colonize. There's just, I feel like the pros don't really outweigh the cons, but there are a couple of points though that could sort of justify the existence of the project, even despite the uh, the cost. And the first of which is that it could have been strictly appearance-based, right? Even if things aren't going well, presenting the facade that the Yuzon Nation is thriving is just as important to them that they are actually thriving. Even if that appearance thing isn't um, the truth, though, it could be justified as a sort of last-ditch effort, you know, to get out of Dodge, right? If war efforts are, if tensions are rising and the war between the Empire and the nation isn't looking particularly bright, um, they could just be like, okay, we're gonna send people off, maybe we'll find somewhere new to relocate, and we won't have to deal with this shit anymore. Um, honestly, I think it could be either. They could have been just to get rid of Ariane because they were aware of how strong she was, but part of me believes that if they really thought she was so dangerous, they would have just tried to re-educate her to harness her power as more of like a soldier than anything, or even turn her into a replica, but she could have been too unstable for that. But it's also fairly likely that because of their politics and their worldview, they could have seen Ariane as more of a threat than an asset. So yeah, there's so many holes in every single theory that th this is what I mean when I say there's no concrete answer to anything. <laughs> So it's really whatever you want to believe is the canon reasoning. Unless Yuri Stern comes out and um, confirms anything for me. So, let's talk about the themes. 
I, I, I think that that's just about all the theories. Um, so now we're going to discuss the major themes of the game, which is so fun. Oh, I love this. Uh, I think this should be about the last section. I'm running, again, I'm running out of daylight, I'm running out of battery. Um, so the big one here is hope versus nihilism. Um, there's two sides of the coin, especially when you look at the relationship between Elster and Ariane. Um, for one, you can look at it from the sense that even in a world so terrible, they still have each other, right? They still have their love, their relationship. And that's sort of the hopeful side of it. Um, and I choose to look at it that way because putting a positive spin on it kind of makes the whole game a little bit less devastating. <laughs> if you hate yourself and you love being miserable, you can take it the other way and you can look at it as a sort of nihilism type of thing where that because the world is so terrible, even though their relationship was so strong, um, it, it was doomed to fail even from the beginning. It, it was never going to last. And um, again, if you choose to look at it that way, I envy you, but uh, it's, it's bad enough already. Another theme I really like is the whole loss of identity and, uh, and loss of individualism thing, because n not that it's a good thing that I want for the world. <laughs> I just think it's portrayed really well. Um, so the idea that individuals, gestalts, were taken out of society and turned into an army of identical robotic individuals, replicas, is just really sad. Um, but it's a good portrayal of how authority can simply just beat the personality out of someone, especially people who stand out. This is supported even further by the fact that when replicas begin to gain personalities that set them apart from replicas of the same type, they're just killed. They're literally just killed decommissioned. Um, you can also see it pretty staunchly in the, uh, in the teacher evaluation of Ariane, where she literally says that her interests and hobbies are no longer acceptable under the nation. Um, so that's just how much more direct can you get? One of the notes on the beach the second time also support this reading. It calls me in a sea of flesh. We will become one, but I can never go back to being me. That sea of flesh is society. And with that, you can also assume the person is being assimilated into that society, just sort of blending in and never being able to stand out. The last theme that I want to talk about is sort of a theory in itself. It has a theory attached to it, so we'll we'll get to that. Um, and it comes down to something called the red eye. Uh, so there's a lot of visuals of the red eye throughout the game, but it's basically an old folklore from Rotfront relating to the concept of pareidolia. Pareidolia is the tendency to perceive certain patterns when looking at meaningless things like the Rorschach test or uh, like seeing a face on like the front of a car. The physical red eye in Signalis is actually a storm caused by high pressure on rot front, which uh, sort of looks like a big red eye. You don't actually see it in the game, but you see things that allude to it. Although a natural phenomenon, that red spot in the sky caused by the storm became symbolic of Rotfront's struggles and uh, their way of life being a perfect metaphor for the constant surveillance state they were put under um, by protectors and the Yusan nation's iron grip on the colonies. Um, that part is not even a theory. That's just, that's just lore, baby. The theory part is that the actual eye itself belongs to an eldritch entity. Um, and I really, I like this one. This one's fun. Much similar to the big flesh monster underlying, maybe the same entity, maybe not. It is possible that if this eldritch creature does actually exist, it's connected to Ariane in some way, especially considering the note we read earlier on the beach. Um, but it's been a while, so I'll reiterate for you. A prison from which the only escape is death. Deep below, the dreamer floats in a sea of flesh. The red eye birthing a new world from their dream for eternity, and each time the dreamer turns over in their sleep, the world turns over too until only flesh remains. So this loosely suggests that something else is causing the time loop. It's just kind of basing it off of Ariane's subconscious, and it's sort of amplifying her bioresonance ability. Um, I like this theory a lot. I think it could actually be correct, especially in the context of the artifact ending, uh, where we see the big eye over the ship watching over the Penrose. It could be that either Ariane is the Eldritch creature or it's sort of like a guardian angel to her. Um, and it doesn't really give a new meaning to the ending, but it does make the ending make a bit more sense. It sort of hints that Elster traded in these mementos in a sort of ritual to this Eldritch god um, for an eternity to spend with Ariane in their happiest moment. And uh, that's it. 
I guess. I would like to talk about the decision for the face reveal, though, because it is, I think, a big step for the channel, and uh, it's something I said I was going to talk about at the end, so we'll do that now. So, I wanted to do this. I, I wasn't, I was going to save this for, like, a big milestone or something, but growth hasn't been particularly steady for the channel. Um, so, I wasn't sure when that arbitrary milestone would be. So, uh, after... And I, so if you missed my, after the gigantic video I posted on YouTube studio, Twitter, discord, I think that was it. Um, telling that I was going to be taking a little bit of a break and I did, I've, uh, it's, it's been a month and a half, two months. Um, I lost a family member and I wasn't intending on my break being so long. I was thinking an extra two weeks, maybe. And then that two weeks turned into a month, month and a half. And, uh, and I've been gone for a long time. So I was like, okay, I might as well make that worth it, which is why I decided to make two videos, uh, and both of them were fucking long, uh, which definitely contributed to how long that break ended up being. And it was bad. It was bad. Uh, I shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have taken that long. Probably should have just made one video, but, um, we're here now. So what does this mean for the channel? Um, now, the reasoning behind it was I I wanted to do something different, um, change up my style a little bit. I started to sort of dabble with the live action stuff, as you could see in uh, the Lies of P video, Alan Wake video, the uh, the Stop Killing Games video, and I think those are the only ones I've, I've done it in so far. What do we want to call those skits? So they, they're more like, like skits, I guess. Um, they're not full, like, sit down, stare at the camera, you know, that, that like this. They're, they're different. Um, and so I want to do more of those, more of, like, themed uh, sh short films I type of things. I don't know. I don't know what to... Like, short live-action storytelling methods um, that I can theme around videos and, uh, and sort of do with those. I have a, lot, I have a couple of those planned for other videos. Um, I would just have to do them, like, get, get around to them. Um, but this... Uh, the existence of my face opens up a lot of new uh, avenues for creativity. I've wanted to, for a long time, branch out into uh, content on music, specific albums, artists I like. Uh, movies and TV are both things I'm very, very into. Don't talk about it much here, because it's a gaming channel. But uh, there's, there are things I, I've wanted to branch out into for a long time. And this past Halloween, I almost made... A video on one of my favorite shows ever and i just didn't <laughs> i just did not do that um and part of the issue with doing that type of content is that with movies and tv shows and uh and and uh, music it's different because you need something to put on screen if you put too many scenes from a television show or from a movie you're gonna get taken down for music you have to put something it can't just be a fucking black screen with music in the background, you're going to get taken down. Um, I mean, if the music's in the video at all, but like this gives me something to put on screen for the times where I don't have something. And not every video is going to have my face in it. Not every video is going to be like this from now on. Um, this is, this is a different type of thing. And again, I'm really worried about how it's going to turn out. I don't think this is going to end up being very good. And so I'm really looking forward to doing different things with this. And, uh, and, and branching out my content a little bit more. Um, yeah, but so, um, I, I guess that's it. Like the, the, my break was a very personal time for me. And so it came with a lot of decisions, um, in my life, not just related to YouTube, but that were very personal and I'm rambling now, but that's fine. Who cares? And again, this is my first foray into live action. It's not going to be very good. I don't think I've said that like 10 times. I'm really worried about how this is going to turn out. Um, I'm going to get better at it. I've, if you go back and look at my, the first stuff I made on YouTube, it was fucking terrible. It's still there. I don't take down videos. It's all of my videos that I've ever uploaded are still there. They're bad. They are bad, but they're still there. And I like to leave them there because it's a reminder of how much I've improved over the time on this platform and uh, how much my content has changed because it was very different. 
and yeah, is that is that the end of my rambling? I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I have a lot of big stuff planned past this now that I'm finally going to be finished with this fucking project. Um, I'm happy with it. I'm happy I did it. I hope it turns out okay. Um, but that's it. That's it for me. Uh, I'm probably going to stream Signalis sometime after I get back. Just as a I'm back type of thing. Um, just for fun. Yeah, that's it. For real. For real. Um, I, I hope this video was okay. Thank you all so much for watching. What? Watching? Wash? Washing? Thank you all so much for watching. I sincerely hope you're still here. That would be awesome. And um, I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you being here. Um, if you did enjoy, please consider subscribing to see more content like this. Maybe not like this. And of course, make sure you like the video and comment. It really helps me out more than you know. Let me know what your favorite part of Signalis was, or uh, if you have any questions, and I'll see if I can answer them for you. I try and respond to most of my comments, unless they're mean, then I just ignore you or respond to you angrily. And obviously you're gonna wanna check out Star Trek Fleet Command, link in the description. Also, that would help me out a ton, and uh, you might actually enjoy the game. I, I genuinely enjoy it. I, I, I do actually play a lot of mobile games, and I like that one, it's fun. But uh, all of that, I would really appreciate. Um, for the last time, Thank you so much for watching, for being here. Um, have a great night, and I will catch you all in the next one.